welcome to the Fat Emperor podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. We're back today on the heart disease topic. As you probably well know, it's the biggest killer in the world. And many people, many heart attacks, you don't get a second chance to even get treatment. You know, around a third of heart attacks uh, result in death. So we're going to be talking with Mark uh, Felstead who's become a pal and he works in Germany, though he's originally UK. And he had a, a horrific experience with major heart disease a few years ago. And we're going to talk through that. We're going to talk through the solutions. We're going to talk through the misunderstandings about prevention. And we're going to talk about the way forward to address this terrible disease. So great to see you again, Mark. Hi, Ivo. It's always a pleasure to see you. Thanks so much. Oh, not at all. No, this conversation is so important. And as you know, I've been distracted away from some of the metabolic uh, imperatives uh, with the other big issue we're having the last year. Uh, but I want to I want to curl around and get back to it. So uh, maybe the best thing is to start off with if you just go through uh, your experience uh, at the time when you had your first major heart incident, because it certainly wasn't expected, is my memory. No, that's right. It was um, well, very unexpected. In fact, I am not your typical cardiac arrest patient. In fact, um, the day is very strong in my memory. I'm, I've always done sport, exercised, thought I was eating a healthy diet, didn't smoke, always watch my weight. And then one evening in August, I left my house to compete in a local duathlon in Berlin. And I kissed my wife goodbye and I kissed my daughter goodbye and I took my racing bike and I didn't know then that that was very nearly the last time I was going to see them because the, the event was quite tough, but um, 200 meters before the finish line, I collapsed with a sudden cardiac arrest, as in what you would call a widow maker. There was a term I didn't know at the time, uh, a widow maker. And um, if it wasn't for the very fast action of two of my competitors, who uh, incredibly luckily were also doctors, uh, they kept me alive with CPR until the emergency services could arrive. And uh, then I was whisked off to hospital and um, operated on, um, found or operated on the angiogram. They put some stents in. And um, to be honest, I woke up two weeks later or 10 days later out of an artificial coma with my wife on one side of me and my sister on the other. And I did not have a clue what happened. I had no idea what, what I was doing there. <sighs> yeah a bolt from the blue and that's that's all too common i forget the exact figures but hundreds of thousands of similar experiences in the us per year and a huge proportion that don't occur near a hospital and end up in mortality so massive issue and you mentioned there the family and that's the other thing because some people it's a terrifying experience you you were saved that in a sense the enormous pain i've heard about like an enormous rock lying on your chest uh, and then the terror of, of where it's going or what's going to happen or are you near care? That's all the personal horror uh, and, of course, the aftermath. But then for the family, the shock of the primary breadwinner, you know, the husband, the partner is now looking down the barrel of a gun in a hospital in a coma. I mean, what, that must have been horrific for, the, for your family. Well, I hope I'm not going to get too emotional about this, either, because I always do. But as you say, for me, um, I didn't feel the pain. Whether, uh, To be honest, whether I had pain before, I couldn't say because it's quite normal. The doctors have told me I, I had a two-day blackout. I couldn't remember any, almost nothing from the two days before my heart attack. But you have to imagine that was an evening in August. The summer evening, my wife knew that I was competing in an event. And she started to get anxious at 9.30, quarter to 10 when I hadn't come back. And then at 10 o'clock, she got that call. She got that call from the emergency services. And I can tell you exactly what they said. They said, Mrs. Felstead, your husband is here. He's had a heart attack. He's with us now and he's stable. But we cannot say if he will survive the next 24 hours. And that is a call that nobody wants to take. That is an absolute bombshell. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a total, total shocker. And when it's unexpected as well, like, I mean, the blood would just drain from your body. I, I can well imagine. Uh, completely shocking. And the whole future then that was so rosy and organized, everything now is under threat. And, and that's when people themselves or family, then they start thinking about prevention or how they could have avoided it. But it's, it's too late in the vast majority of cases to, to think then. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you probably know as well, I got the statistics somewhere that the survival from a widow maker from a sudden cardiac arrest is actually about 
six percent so i was incredibly lucky i mean it's a bit of a paradox it's like some people have said to me oh well you know uh, aren't you upset that you did it while you know you were doing sport or something like this well you know what either that could have happened i could have been in the woods on my own running i could have been on a bike ride 50 kilometers in the middle of nowhere i'd just come back from a two-week holiday in france and i was doing a lot of sport every day i mean i was really fit so the fact that it happened during that competition where people were around me in particular two doctors who knew exactly straight away what was going on and what to do that was just incredibly lucky yeah, I mean, that's dodging a bullet extraordinaire. And, you know, funny, I did an interview I think, with Warren the other day, and I showed the clip of the president of the American Heart Association. So this is a guy who's 52. You know, he's not skinny, but he certainly looks uh, ruddy and, and robust. And he gives a lecture at the annual conference, right? And I think he's on the preventative meds, is my understanding, and his cholesterol is low. So he felt he was pretty solid, even with a bad family history. And then a couple of hours after his lecture, he, he drops dead, essentially, and only his daughter was able to give him CPR, and there were doctors everywhere, and they got the defibrillator. He would have been gone. Um, so it just goes to show you, like, even those guys. Now, my suspicion is they're all cholesterol-focused, and they don't know, unfortunately, about insulin and leptin and glucagon and everything that, that you now know and I've been talking about for eight years. I didn't know about these terms three years ago either. Um, yeah, and the doctors, I mean, I know my card. I love my cardiologist, he saved my life. He's also, you know, we're in constant contact, um, but he's very much, he's a young guy, but he's old school. He's very much like, we need to get your uh, cholesterol down, we need to get your lipids down. And um, I don't know if you want to move on to that now, but I can tell you exactly after the heart attack, when I was released and, you know, um, from hospital and started to recover, I sat with my wife in his surgery and my wife asked him specifically, Dr. Crisper, what should Mark follow? They tell you in the hospital, eat, eat a Mediterranean diet, but I have no idea what, no one tells you what that is. And, and my wife asked the doctor, what should Mark eat that can make a difference? Should he eat nuts, olive oil, whatever? And do you know what he said, Iva? He said, nothing makes a difference it's all a, a drop in the ocean and i was like oh my god because since i've met you or he met you i've learned so much and i've managed to make a huge difference and i'm happy to talk about that as well by following some of your uh, diet guidelines by reading your book eat rich eat rich and live long i've managed to make massive improvements to my blood values yeah, and that's what it's all about. It's funny, when you understand the science, and I think to understand the science, you have to come at it independently with only one burning desire, like I did and many people have done, the desire to know. Uh, and I've been 30 years in technical problem solving, so it's just part of my life, my makeup. I always got to know, as the Clint Eastwood Dirty Harry movie famous scene said, I got to know. And if you go that way, you find out the reality. And the reality is that it's an enormously influential or influenceable thing, your future demise, massively. Yeah. And it's yeah. diet and lifestyle and exercise helps, but it, it certainly can't out, outrun a bad diet. So it, it helps your health, but it, it, it's not going to save you as you, you found out. Uh, so yeah, the, the people, the sad thing is that the cholesterol thing in some ways would be better that they had never discovered the cholesterol correlation back in the 50s and 60s. Because by becoming fixated on that, they picked a weak associational risk factor. A pharmaceutical business was built on the back of it. And that whole infrastructure that your cardiologist obviously is clearly part of, it's not his fault, that's who he's educated. That whole structure is massive and it stops real science getting back in. So it's a block to actually getting to the real science and getting the huge benefits. It's, it's tragic really, isn't it? Yeah, totally. And, and I don't know if, if you agree with me, but I, I've, I've asked a lot of the doctors that I've met, I've asked the various questions about nutrition and this, that and the other. And did you know, Ivor, it takes five years or more to study to be a cardiologist. And I think that in medical school, you have a two week block on nutrition. What, if if even that, I mean, it's just it's just not considered part of the of the solution. So, I mean, I've been very lucky since then meeting you through uh, the various channels, meeting a couple of other doctors who've 
looked at different measures or had different uh, points of view and yeah and uh, I, now I use words like metabolic disease and insulin resistance and uh, this has really sort of given me a lot of strength moving forward actually. Excellent and we're going to turn to that now um, but just one thing occurs to me as you said that my daughter is in second year medical school and uh, she went through in first year the kind of insulin and uh, maybe glucagon and ketones and also the cholesterol stuff and how we laughed because she obviously is aware of the real story the real science but they never touched on the important stuff and the linkages to health uh, it was just generic so it's still a huge problem and then I said well maybe in second or third year you know they'll get into more insulin resistance in disease and she said no that's it and I said what do you mean that's it you've only you've only done first year she said no next year and the year after the syllabus we're, we're finished with all that stuff now we've done it the physiology that's done oh so it's and, it's it's uh, my experience it's crazy it's cr crazy yeah. so your learnings then you obviously change things around and again myself and dr gerber etc in her book has never pushed hard keto because we take the view a healthy diet is low carb, no processed food and all the other stuff. Get your sun and sleep and, and vitamins and minerals. Um, but hard keto can be a powerful tool for, for diabetes and maybe for neurological problems. So it's kind of slightly more medicinal. Uh, so we figure if you do low carb and you skip meals, you begin to skip meals and eat sparingly, fasting, together they will end up putting you into the keto spectrum in and out and are probably the best fit for most people. Um, but what what did you do generally? Well, okay, so the, the, I've gone two stages, to be honest. I mean, first of all, I've never had a weight problem, so I've never come at it from a point of view of needing to lose weight. I've uh, never had to do that, uh, luckily. So um, the first time I, I read um, Eat Rich, Live Long, yeah, and I, I swallowed it like a gospel because it was it was coming with inform coming at me with information that I just never heard of before yeah I mean it, it's crazy you just you know you're if ever you look at anything to do with cardiology or heart disease all you hear about is cholesterol low fats and all of a sudden there you are saying you know the opposite end of the spectrum so to speak eat, eat rich and eat fats and eat animal foods and all the rest of it and it was coming off the back of a series I have to be honest where I'd been veggie and vegan for a year so I'd got my so I'd seen my blood results sort of you know after your heart attack you like you take any you you know you're like a drowning person in the harbor you'll take any boy that you can grab hold of so I'm like oh VG and veganism that's what I've been doing wrong so I I came I came out of that and then I found you or your book and then I started on the eat rich live long so I basically cut carbs down to a minimum and cut out all sugar as I could and started to really eat again you know steaks and eggs and one thing and another and within within I think I had the first blood test results within the first two months that I tried and what was really positive was with the HDL had gone up the good cholesterol uh, the trigs were starting to come down I can give you the figures if you want, but I know exactly I've got the I've got them written down. They're in my head. Um, the vitamin D started to make an improvement, and and this was a, a big one, Ivor, because I had been going to my doctor for years, and she had been testing my blood results every six or twelve months, and we could not get my vitamin D up, no matter what. Yeah, and she'd always said, "Oh, Mr. Fell said you need to improve your vitamin D." Now I didn't know that vitamin D. I think you will agree with me. It was a, it's a strong marker for metabolic illness at the end of the day. And, and there it was staring at me in the face. And um, so anyway, so my HDL was going up. My uh, trigs were going down. I even managed to reduce some of I mean, the lipoprotein R is my big bad boy. That's genetically, apparently can't do anything about it. Even that dropped by 15, 20 percent by changing my diet. And that is something that the, no medication can even offer that, actually, at the moment. I mean, you can go and have blood filters twice a week, which is not a very nice process. Uh, but medication-wise, no. So, I, you know, I'll just on that basis, I'd started after two, three months to really start to see good results, yeah. Excellent. And, yeah, just to recap on those briefly, though, obviously we have talked many times before. So the HDL up, the trigs down, classic reduction in insulin resistance. The vitamin D is an incredibly important marker like it's not that magic d pills bring up your d and magically fight disease necessarily but it's more that the vitamin d is a massive marker and if it's low 
that, like that's like the tip of an iceberg showing up ahead you got to find out why it's low and you got to get it up to ancestral human 35 or 40 nanogram it's it's just a no-brainer and uh it's just interesting that you had that and my my sponsor previously david bobbitt who promotes the calcium scan to save lives uh he also had a vanishingly low vitamin d when he actually had his massive uh heart disease experience with three blocked arteries so it's a crucial and the irony is if your doctor thought it was too low it would have been profoundly low because what they consider to be too low is is off my scale low uh i would consider 25 whatever the the the, the units are 25 what? when 30 is the yeah now if it was 25 nanogram i'd be surprised a doctor really thinks that that was low uh is it possible it was 25 nanomole which is like 12 or 13 nanogram which is profound uh, either way it's it's a master she's marker. a big fan of vitamin d so she probably ah. would have picked it up okay so you weren't catastrophically low like many are sadly okay and you get it up you can get it up by without supplement and so on right the things that everyone knows drives it up uh, you can actually get it up just by improving metabolic health. It will rise naturally. But if you add then in UV exposure and you add in D-rich foods and maybe supplements, then, of course, you get a rapid uh, acceleration towards health. And the last one, LP little a, yeah, that's a tricky one. A lot of people ask me about it, and I've done a few blog posts on it explaining it. So it's not so much that LP little a is the demon that goes into your arteries, although most cholesterol in plaque is LP little a variety for complicated reasons. Uh, but it's more that if you have high LP little a, it marks you out as a person with a genetic predisposition and susceptibility towards heart disease. So you think of it more like a marker of your physiology or genetics. You are potentially high risk, which you wear. Uh, whereas I have super high LP little a and a zero calcium score at 48. Uh, even after 20 years of being overweight and with high insulin and stuff. So it's not a definite marker for problem, but you're absolutely right too. The only papers where LP little a has been reduced because it's generally just genetic and set and it comes from your liver. You make it, by the way, um, is a higher fat, lower carb diet. There's a couple of papers, but that's the only thing that it, that's ever moved that needle. So it's not surprising you draw and 15% or 20 is about what you'll get, which is what you got. Yeah, but they probably get swept under the carpet, those kind of studies, because until there's a <laughs> until there's a truck behind it, they're not gonna. And um, one thing I didn't mention um, is blood sugar. Yeah, the HIBC, uh, BC1. HbA1c, yeah. HbA1c, beg, beg your pardon. Um, and interestingly enough, my doctor had also picked up on that and said, uh, Mr. Felser, we have to watch that. You're fine at the moment but you're heading towards pre-diabetic. I think it was like 5.6 or something, 5.7. And I know that when we talked about that, you said, Mark, that's not pre-diabetic. You are almost there. Yeah, 5.7 is the threshold with one caveat and one very interesting exception, but it would not be in your case. So 5.4, 5.5 is kind of normal. Up at 5.67, you're into, it's likely there's a problem, very much so. And then 5.8 or 9, you know. So that's kind of the, the rule of thumb. But the other thing is that you sometimes see high blood glucose and even HbA1c is up at 5.7 that are not a problem. But that's specifically coming out in some keto and carnivore people. And it would appear that they go so low in carbohydrate and glucose coming in, their body naturally adapts to maximize glucose and spare glucose from use in the muscles. Obviously, it, it, it adapts to this very low glucose income. And what you do get is you get higher glucagon and the body system to make plenty of glucose be there for the brain just in case goes a little further than uh, on average and those people actually you you pick up higher glucose readings and even a1c's but it's kind of for a good reason so that makes this stuff very tricky and you need to be talking to someone who knows their stuff but in your case it would have been classic you are moving into diabetic physiology and that brings in the whole milieu of risk for all kinds of chronic disease including obviously your heart yeah yeah and I mean, we had a conversation before and I, I'll never forget the thing that you told me because, you know, I was a, a very active cyclist, triathlete, runner, training a lot. 
And I think a lot of people who also do sport will identify when I say and in, in the cycling world, in the endurance sport world, we're used to carbo loading. Yeah, you say, oh, yeah, if I'm going out for a long training ride tomorrow morning, it's a really good idea to eat lots of pasta tonight. Right. And and you were like, and also I'm a big fan of, you know, HIIT training, high interval, high intensity interval training. I always went out and gave it the, the full, the full works. And then you told me, well, you told me, Mark, you're, you're running your body like a Formula One engine that's running all the time at 8,000 revs on high octane fuel and your pipes are going to burn out. So, and this <laughs> is like, and I'm like, what? <laughs> that- well, you know, Mark, that was in my original version of the book before I joined up with Dr. Gerber and we, we did a, the whole thing with professional editors. I had a, a various images of little high octane cars and I made that very point that, yes, you can achieve great sporting things by using high octane glucose fuel, but you are running an engine really hot. It's an analogy for what people are doing. So ironically, you get these you know, ex-athletes and the famous uh, British Olympic rower and then Professor Noakes, who's an incredible athlete running. Um, they end up like type 2 diabetic in middle age. It's like, how did that happen? So they get all the benefits of the exercise, which if they had done it on a low-carb, high-fat diet, they would have been just as performance or maybe better for endurance performance, but they would not have burned out the engine. It'd be like running a diesel engine or a fuel oil engine, you know, lots of power geared up, but, but not like the, uh, yeah, that, it's a great analogy. I often think as well of those planes they had in the 70s when I was a kid at the end of a wire and they had a real little petrol engine and it, it was like, it sounded like a, a, a very angry insect But I remember thinking, wow, they put in a very high octane fuel, they get it started and it screams, it screams. And I often, even as a kid, I was very technical. I thought, how does that engine not burn out? And the answer was they did burn out, but you know, they lasted a while. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's funny because my new sort of modus operandi is life's a marathon, not a sprint. And I was basically sprinting. You know what I mean? (laughs) And uh, I mean, one of the, one of the things is that because of my heart attack or the heart attack that I had and the various things that I've had since then, I can no longer enjoy my sport to anywhere near that kind of level because I'm just not taking that risk. And, and it's almost like my appeal to those who are doing that. If you want to keep doing your sport for another five, 10, 15 years without incident, um, maybe you just want to take it back a bit on the intensity. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And I, I think it's beginning to emerge now that the best exercise is the weights and body weight movements to failure where you do x repetitions until you can't do that last one and that triggers the muscles to become glucose burners and build more muscle which is the biggest indicator of longevity i like the studies on this they did studies on older people and the biggest predictor of longevity bigger than all the other risk factors put together uh, was measurements where they had to get up from the floor with one hand and measurements of muscle strength that was the biggest predictor by a mile and it's an important lesson so we might curl around then to taking action so you already talked about what you did uh, for yourself and your family obviously is an enormous part of it uh, but you also have a passion now to help others a bit like when i started off in 2013 my first lecture i discovered this stuff and i just felt intuitively I gotta let people know this because there's gonna be people who die unnecessarily because they don't know what I just found out and I fixed my bloods and I fixed everything. I gotta let... So I went into my corporate and I started doing lectures to 100 plus engineers, technicians, just, just gave them lectures to tell them. And, and then I obviously the rest is history. But you also had the same kind of drive to say, wow, I gotta let people know this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're. Um, I'm starting something called We Love Our Heart, weloveourheart.com, and it's basically to build the awareness of uh, heart disease, to talk about uh, what we can do or what you can do to avoid possibly the, uh, to avoid it and pr- to prevent it, and to also maybe talk about the, um, you know, the, the signs that might be there in your blood tests like me three years ago, the signs were potentially there of the trouble I was heading towards the time bomb that was ticking away in my chest, but I didn't know where to look, so to speak. And if you just follow the classic cardiologists and the classic doctors, you're not going to find, you're only going to get 80% of the results. And 
um, it's how I how I came across you in the first place was was basically like looking for answers. Why me? What can I do now? What can make a difference? And I've learned so much over the last uh, year and a half in particular that I want to share this with as many people as possible. Yes, I want to get on board and and help them or particularly help their help their families avoid the potential devastation of of losing a loved one like happened nearly very nearly happened to me. Yeah. Absolutely. And I love that. We love our heart. It's, it's, it's a great phrase. And that's what you got to do. You got to love your heart. You got to protect it. You got to preventatively just look after it. It's your main pump. If it goes, you're gone. And uh, actually, we haven't mentioned it yet, but it's the central plank, of course, for me and for David Bobbitt, my sponsor as well, to get the message out in the calcification scan. Because five minute scan, you know, a few hundred bucks, you immediately look inside and find out all the problems that are there in five minutes that you can never find out from the blood markers. So I think you were planning as well to try and uh, obviously promote the calcium scan for people to discover and take action. Uh, but it's a little, it's a little tricky because it's a medical procedure and people need to go direct, but at least get the awareness out. Totally. The, yeah, totally. The calcium scan, the CT calcium scan. And in fact, I've sent uh, three people to my um, doctor in Berlin who will do that for them. And they've all had zero scores, which is fantastic. But then they're like, OK, Mark, thanks for the advice. We don't need you anymore. Whatever. <laughs> but great news well, for them. And actually, I wanted to mention how I came across you in the first place, which is also quite an interesting story, because um, like a year and a half ago, I was really searching for why me and what could I do and what is cardiovascular disease all about because so often you go to the doctor and they will manage the symptoms but they won't be looking for the root causes. Long story short, I came, um, thanks to YouTube and its analytics, I came across the Widowmaker as we, if you like this we recommend you watch this and I flicked on the Wid Widowmaker, I think I had to pay at the time, I can't remember. Um, but honestly, the, you might know from the beginning of the film is the 911 call that a, um, a woman makes as her husband is um, having a heart attack next to her. And, and that's my story, Ivan. And I literally, I think I cried for half an hour watching that film. And my wife's like, what the hell's the matter? You know, what are you doing? I sat there with my headphones on, sobbing away. And I'm like, this is my story. This is my story. And from that film, um, I came across you and your, your podcast and all your lectures and then also with the Extra Time movie which is another fantastic film and they're both films that everybody should see because it tells you so much about the route to take to avoiding heart attack or to finding out your own risk um, because there are things you can do but the big worry is people who are just walking around with just not knowing that maybe tomorrow they're going to hit the wall and bang they're gone that's that's it so so grateful for that it's really changed my life and um, made me so much more aware of what i'm doing uh, what's going on in my body at least and actually david bobbage uh, uh, enabled those movies you mentioned to be made and i think you're going to try and help get those out to people as well through we love our heart and get the message out there they can change your life they're fantastic yeah but ideally people who have not yet uh had this terrible experience you know see them and take action before they have it and that's the whole idea of calcification is to give you the wake up call and give you something to track your progress. And the last thing I'll mention there is IHDA, IHDA.ie. And there you can see all the scan centers and, and get lots of other videos of experts. But no, that's super. I, I might put a link as well at the, the outro here to uh, you have a website now. I, I'm guessing you're trying to set up a club. Yeah. Hmm? Which? We love our heart .com is up and running. Yeah. Excellent. So we love our heart .com. And as I agreed, no problem instantaneously, uh, way back, I don't know, it was maybe six or eight or 12 months ago, uh, that any support I can give to that group, you know, I, I get involved there. And it's still close to my heart, even though I have moved into the viral challenge, because I think it's a huge challenge for the world that's kind of immediate and needs to be dealt with. Uh, I still want to, as I said, keep supporting people in avoiding heart disease and heart attacks and all diabetes alzheimer's certain cancers all these terrible chronic diseases that can all be addressed the risk of them with the same intervention and isn't that just there's a beauty about this that and it's like an engineering complex problem solving when you find on a production line that has issues you find a very subtle set of things that will will resolve the issue 
usually what happens if you've really found the best root causes a lot of other things will improve on the line also because the whole health of the line is improving and that's exactly what we have here it doesn't have to be rocket science it's a basic set of lifestyle changes habits for the rest of your life make a healthier fitter better mental acuity slimmer risk plummets everything in your life gets better uh, everything gets better people need to understand if they make this switch they make their whole life better it's not just avoiding one particular problem so that's the passion i have behind it also me too and it sounds too good to be true but i'm living proof mm -hmm. Ivor. and thanks to you for that <laughs> well <laughs> no thank you mark and anyone who thinks it's too good to be true or is naive enough well go have your low-fat diet eat your sugary cereals uh, pop your statin pills and uh, you know off you go over there and see how your outcome compares to people who listen to us and I'll tell you it's a huge difference so good note to end it on and we'll circle back in a while and check in on how things are going Mark maybe we will do thanks so much I have a great talking to you thank you Mark pleasure <laughs> And just a reminder that I do need support to continue putting together all of this content and at patreon.com forward slash Ivor Cummins or for PayPal at tinyurl.com forward slash Ivor Cummins where you can do a one-off or a monthly support. So I'd really appreciate that guys and keep me getting the science out there and countering perhaps the more biased corporate type science. Thank you.